Welcome to Spartan Up Podcast. Here we are in uh, Brooklyn Boulders. Uh, this one is really fascinating. It wouldn't be, if I looked at the list and said, these are going to be the great ones, it wouldn't have jumped out at me. And it's incredible. It, this is a guy who, uh, chaplain in the military for how long, Tim? A uh, good 35 years or so. Huge career. Longer. But it, the, the, the lessons that, that he imparts and the stories that he tells and, and the grace with which he does it is really quite something. So I'm just going to leave it at that. You can go I'm, see for yourself. One quick question. How many guys have lasted in the military that long? Well, don't answer it. Let's learn. Fantastic. And who you're going to learn with is retired Colonel Nye, Tim Nye. Sephra, who isn't retired because she... I'm, not, I'm never tired. There's no... Anyway. Sephra the Sprout. There you go. We oh, got, sprouting. Uh, Thanks. We, we, we got our fearless leader, Joe. I'm Johnny. And our fearless director, Marion. Let's go see uh, Thomas Soldrum. Yeah, welcome, Spartans. Uh, I'm here at the Pentagon, and today uh, it's, it's really special for me because we're going to interview a good friend of mine, uh, Chaplain uh, Tom Soldier, actually Brigadier General Tom Soldier, Chaplain, who is the Deputy Chief of Chaplains for the entire United States Army. When we were together at SOCOM, I mean, you would get on a plane and go to Afghanistan or Iraq to check on the troops and say you'd be back in two weeks, and it'd be like six months later, you, you would reappear. That has happened. Yeah, that, that has been known to happen. <laughs> so you'll, you'll just go. I mean, when most people, outside of people in the Army, they might not understand, you know, they don't understand that one, a chaplain maybe is even in the Army. Right. And two, you're, you're sitting there with a Ranger combat patch on, You've served in special operations units most of your career, correct? I mean, yes. you know, you've um, been deployed, I don't know how many times, I don't know if you know how many times, but you've been everywhere that there's bullets flying, and that goes all the way back to, when did you first join the Army? Well, I first joined the Army in 1974, and I was an enlisted soldier, so this really dates me. Now you've embarrassed yeah. me, Tim, thank yeah. you. No, 74. But, uh, yeah, 1974, and the Vol Army was just being stood up at that time. It was the end of the uh, winding down of the Vietnam era. Um, and uh, so I came in on the delayed entry program. So when I was uh, in between my junior and senior year in high school, I had to get parental permission. I took my oath that summer. That's where I, my military service started, and it's really continued through uh, to today. I was either on active duty or in the reserves um, while I was in transition. Well, I, I don't know if you know, but are you, you've got to be one of the longer-serving officers in the army currently serving i'd rather I, not go there okay but i but i'm assuming <laughs> that you're one of the more senior by yes. time uh anyway but so you took a long circuitous route to get here so i grew up in a rural on a, i grew up on a ranch in north dakota um and everything was pretty homogenous uh, and then my uh, family moved into town into fargo uh when i was about uh, 11 years old um and then my parents divorced which yeah, coming traumatic. out, yeah, pretty traumatic. Come and then coming out of that, 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 uh, a culture and an environment where that just didn't occur. That was not routine. And then, as a young person, I, and looking back on it, I mean, you know, I accept responsibility for the decisions and choices that I made as a young, right, sure. young person. So I'm not def deferring to my parents at this point. Right. Um, but uh, so then I really, you know, became kind of a rebellious young person, um, angry, um, and made a lot of poor choices and in relationships and just life decisions. So uh, I didn't fare well in the public school system. They invited me not to come back. Wow. So you find yourself in Germany. Yes. When and you had all the freedom. Yeah, and so, you know, you grow up and, you like, I go back to the bad choices. So a lot of the things that were going on in the late 60s, early 70s, you know, you can just let your imagination sure. roll. But uh, the the drugs and the alcohol of that, of that era, you know, and when you put on the uniform and, in the, and it's a different army, that, era, that, that was a different army. And so the army, we were coming out of a Vietnam conflict, a protracted conflict. Uh, the army was, uh, as General Abrams at the time stated, you know, the army had lost its soul and the army needed to, to, uh, um, to be reinvigorated. Uh, hence, you know, things like the Abrams Charter. Standing up the Rangers, you know, a model of what a soldier should look like and act like and, and the conduct. But that's the army I came into. So it was a very troubled army. We still had people who had been drafted who were in. 
uh, at that time, and I brought the baggage of my youth with me. I had significant drug addiction issues. I had significant alcohol issues. That was my way of coping. Um, and then an NCO, a non-commissioned officer, um, who was a medic, um, Doc McElroy. So you got to also understand who's an African American. You got to understand the times. This is a racially divided army. Right. There's a lot of racial tension. Um, there were riots, for example, on military installations. There were things going on back in the continental United States. Uh, so this was very, a very difficult season, and for an, uh, for an African American to take an interest in a white guy from North Dakota was not common. Um, and he just was a human connection for me. He actually took time to get to know me. He actually do what I think a leader should do, <laughs> you know, and that is, is, is know their people. And so he just, uh, he was a person of deep faith. Um, he didn't, he wasn't preachy. Right. Yeah, he just lived it. Um, and he had a very winsome personality, and he always was very kind to me. And, uh, and so through the, through the course of that relationship, um, I started to really look in and see where I was headed and began to ask hard questions. Is this really where I want to be? Is this the kind of person I want to be? And how can I get out of this? You know, what's the way, the exit strategy from what I've created? Um, and then faith became a very, very important vehicle for that to occur. And my life immediately began to, to transform and change. I was awakened to, wow, there's a world out there and I've been letting it pass me by and I'm not taking my role and responsibility as a meaningful member of society and filling it. And it was like a light bulb went off. A yeah, cloud lifted. Yeah, absolutely, a cloud lifted. And so faith is a very, very important um, part of my formation. And I can, anything that has... Anything positive, I would say, for the remainder of my years to this date that has occurred is a direct result of, of that, that place of beginning and I, attributing those things to uh, God's hand and the Lord's hand in my life. And, and then what he did is, is uh, you know, just because you have a, a, a spiritual awakening or a conversion experience doesn't mean that everything is cleaned up. You know, so he realized, you know, you, you need somebody to help mentor you and, and work with you. So he introduced me to the chaplain, mm, McElroy. McElroy clearly saw the potential in you, right? There, That Absolutely. phrase about some people see an acorn and yep. only see an acorn and some people see the tree, right, that it's going to become. So I think he was a guy who was looking at the tree when he was looking at you. Because even with all that, even with that transformation and, and you kind of rededicating your life and seeing things, you're a long way from a general. Yes. Instead of a burpee break, today we have a tip from Spartan SGX. Did you know your feet have 33 joints in them? Yet in a world of dress shoes, high heels, concrete, and wood floors, we use our feet more like they have just one or two. Rolling a golf ball or lacrosse ball or just manipulating our feet in our own hands can reawaken these joints and give you a stronger sense of the ground, which reduces the risk of lower limb injuries in running. Become unstoppable. Spartan SGX Training. All right, so welcome back, everybody. And again, I'm here with Chaplain Soldier. Listen, I could listen to you talk all day because I think your story is fascinating, but we have some time constraints, so we are going to shoot ahead. So now you find yourself, you're back in the Army, you're, you're commissioned, you're an officer, and you're a chaplain. How do you end up in a Ranger Regiment? How do you become the, the, the Ranger's chaplain or Special Operations chaplain? On, along the way, I picked up a wife. Okay. Um, and four kids. <laughs> you bring a family with you, and I think that's very important because a lot of things I want to talk about, you've got to have the backdrop of the family. Mm. My first assignment was in the 82nd Airborne Division, okay. and retired Lieutenant General Vines right. was my battalion commander. And that's where I got the opportunity to you know, go to airborne school. Jump out of planes. Jump out of planes. Test your got faith. The <laughs> opportunity, you got that right. And then he made it possible uh, for me to go to ranger school. He said, would you like to go? I said, yeah. So I hadn't been a chaplain barely a year and a half. So that just began for me a, a series of deployments. Um, my wife and I jokingly say that we, we shared a parallel path, uh, but we didn't, we, we didn't share memories. So I have experiences, the family has experiences, but they're not mm -hmm. shared experiences. Mm -hmm. And so we have to balance those things. So coming back, that was the Rangers was the window back into the special operations community. And from there I went to JSOC and Special Forces Command and SOCOM and, and other assignments. But uh, uh, the Rangers was really a foundational, uh, I think, 
assignment for me that really kind of tested me, pushed my limits as a chaplain. Um, and uh, I think it was just an invaluable but, w- time w- in my life. H- how? You mean physically or, or dealing with the having to take on the issues of, of the Rangers? I mean, if, yes. what they're seeing and doing and becoming the emotional sponge for them almost. Yeah, these, uh, I mean, this they, is, uh, you know, just the very nature of, uh, you know, the mission mm-hmm. requires, uh, you know, the taking of life and the residual collateral that is associated with that, you know. So not only are you, um, not only are you uh, a sounding board for those experiences for your rangers, but you're sharing those experiences with them. Right. So, you know, the residual of those activities uh, affect you as well. So that, that's what I mean. I think it was a combination of, uh, of being assigned in the Rangers initially was really, I think it stretched me as a chaplain. It pushed me physically, mentally, emotionally, my first assignment. And then coming back at the regiment um, and then, you know, 9-11 and all the deployments and associated things like uh, that, you know, the loss of Rangers those that were wounded. I mean, um, to this day, I mean, I still remember dates. I still remember names. I still remember. Well, and, it's, and I don't want to go down this road, but I, that's, I want people to understand how many services you've been to. You know, I mean, more than anybody should have to. Tim, I couldn't even begin to, I, I mean, you know, um, uh, hundreds of them. Right. Yeah. And yeah. that's... That, I know. I mean, that takes a toll on, on any human, you know. So again, if you, if, and for you, you've got your spiritual background. We haven't even talked about your physical fitness, you know. Again, I know that you used to run ultra marathons and just go out on a Saturday and run one and be back at work on Monday after running a hundred miles, like nothing. So I know you keep yourself in shape, but how, how do you kind of steal yourself f- from that kind of? what you see and what yeah. you hear and the, I, the pain of all of that. Yeah, you know, we use the term all the time, balance. I don't like that term. Okay. Life isn't about achieving balance. It's about integration. So you, 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 we love to use the term resilience. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, resilience is really the integration of elements into your life that enable you to be flex with adversity when it comes your way. So I look at it, I think from my vantage point, I look at it, physical is one element. So I must physically maintain, uh, uh, my, sustain myself physically. I need to ensure that I do all the right things in terms of you know, what I eat, physical regimen, exercise, all those things. Those are very important. Um, you know, mental exercise, you know, being a person who's well-read, uh, emotional, being able to you know, know where I'm at and keep those things in check. Uh, and then spiritually to keep, you know, that's a, for me, uh, that, that is where I draw a lot of my strength from. That enables me to digest or take in those things, you know, and then process them uh, and put them back out into meaningful perspective in life. And I think uh, I, I had a sergeant major that, you know, we used to do these briefings, you know, post, uh, we do these briefings, you know, po- post-deployment reintegration briefings, right. you know, we talk about things like, you know, you need to make sure you identify things like post-traumatic stress. And so one day he just came up to me and said, Chaplain, you know I love chaplains, right? And I said, yes, Sergeant Major, I know you do. And he said, Chaplain, you know what? When are you going to talk about post-traumatic order? And I said, Sergeant Major, that is, an flat, that, is an, that is an awesome insight because you've just touched on a truth that is absolutely paramount to what, in fact, we never, the narrative that really needs to be told we hear so much about the post-traumatic stress, the negative side. Right. What we don't talk about is the positive side. So if I was to put my wife right there and she would talk to you about these years of separation, she'd say, I'm better for it. I'm stronger. Mm. Our marriage is deeper. I'm a better person as a result of it. So I guess what I would communicate for myself and I think a lot of other soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, we don't want to be pitied. Right. That- we don't want that. Right. You know, I what always, we want I is always to dislike be, when people say, did you have to go? I mean, when I'd say I'm in the Army, oh, did you have to go to Afghanistan? Yeah. I well, think no, I the story to, that needs to. to be told is, is we're a better. Yes. We're, we're better for, as a result of enduring hardship, as going through those things. So the bonds of relationship 
with people are deeper as a result of what you shared. Well, you are you are a 100% on message if you work for Spartan as well. I'll let you know that our our boss, uh, founder Joe DeSena, uh, his phrase is obstacle immunity, right? And so basically, the more obstacles and challenges you face, the easier they are for the very next one, right? Yeah. What can you might be share for just the broader audience or how they can kind of overcome whatever challenge faces their life? Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. I think, first of all, it's... Uh, it's what's foundational in your life. So, you know, it's like running a race. You don't just decide to get up one morning and, oh, I'm going to go run this race. And yippee. Well, I have. But. I have. Yeah. <laughs> no, I got a story about that, but we'll spare But for the sake of time. But yeah. Yeah. So we're, you know, but if you're conditioned to that point, if you're already conditioned and right. getting up one day and running that race, you can maybe do it. Right. Um, whereas if somebody's never done it before, th- that's a process. So I, I think when life throws things at us, what is, what is foundational to us, what, where our moorings, where we're grounded is really going to help us to overcome adversity. That's a starting point. So you can't just take an empty tank or an unconditioned person and then expect them to perform at an optimal level. There's a process, and life, life brings those things our way to strengthen us. It goes back to that post-traumatic order right. issue. Um, so... And now the, the invaluable aspects of what will help you in those times is let's start with a negative. Isolation is never a good thing. So if you're in training or if you're doing something, you know, you, you, it's never in isolation. You might be performing on your own, but it's never in isolation of others. You're being observed. You're touching others in the process. So isolation is never a good thing, healthy thing in anything. And what is a natural tendency sometimes in adversity it's is to turn in. Turn in, right. Yeah, you isolate yourself. That's the most damaging thing that you can do. Strength, a strong person recognizes like a cord of three strands is not easily broken. They, a strong person re- recognizes immediately the importance of others. So connection, relationships are really important when you're going through adversity. The, the ability to have the strength to be transparent about what you're going through and being able to open up and share that with other people is really a strength. That's not a sign of weakness. That's a strength. Right. Uh, really, I would say, conversely, a sign of weakness is a person who lacks the ability to do that very thing. To either ask or to recognize that they need yeah, the help. Absolutely. The and yeah. then I think, you know, on a professional level, it's then where do I go to get that help? Yeah. You know, so, so it, it, you know, you may be a person who's in a faith community and that, and there may be answers there. Right. Um, it may require, you know, it may require some other kind of expertise, whether it's, you know, a professional counselor, if it's some kind of issue that you're going through in a relationship. Yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Or, or whatever it is in life that you have these, these touchstones, you have these connections, and you know where to go in, in time of difficulty to get, you know, recharged. It's just, it's kind of like, you know, mile 26 in the marathon, I mean, you can see it, you know, it's coming, your body's telling you to quit. Right. Just quit now, stop, you know, and you can see it. And where you draw encouragement from is a lot of times it's a person who's running next to you and you see them and you realize they're going through the same agony you are, but we can do this together and we can finish strong. And so I think a person who's going to overcome adversity is a, a person who has oriented their life and recognizes that uh, there's strength that they can draw from outside of themselves, whether it's their faith, whether it's their family, whether it's their friends, whether it's a professional. Um, in time of difficulty, a strong person doesn't turn in. It reaches out. They reach out, and they excel in the process, and they find that they can be pressed beyond what they thought were the limits of their capacity to endure and move past that and, and what that does for a person. So I would say in my own life, I'm sitting here today and we were joking off camera, you know, so how's this like being a general? You know, I got to pinch myself, you know, and when I consider, when you look back to where this all began, right. yeah. I mean, pretty humble beginnings. It is, it is. And how do you get here? Not alone. Yeah. Great answer. Yeah, you, do, you don't get here alone. You get here because a lot of other people along the way invested in you believed in you, supported you, and you embraced it. And then in turn, you don't want to disappoint them. So in your adversity, in your struggle, you say, I can't let them down, so I can't let myself down. So I've got to press, and I've got to find the answers, the solutions. And I think that when people are going through, through struggle and adversity, 
strive to make that connection. That's where strength comes from. And so, I mean, that may not be the most uh, uh, sexy uh, st- uh, strategy or set of well, tools, I, but, I, but I think it's worked. Well, I, it's served me well my entire life. Well, it's definitely something that can translate for everybody. All of these things that integrate into your identity and who you are. So for me, faith is just a, so, such an important part because it's really where I derive meaning and purpose for life, this transcendence to existence, that there's something other. You know, yeah. uh, Serving your nation is a part of that, a wonderful part of that. Serving with soldiers is a, is a part of that. Your family is all a part of that. But at the end of the day, you're serving something larger than yeah. what, what's in front of you. And, uh, and so I think that, that, that having that transcendent worldview, in my estimation, faith uh, gives you that. Um, and I believe it gives you a leg up on the adversity obstacle. Yeah. It really does. I'm sure it does. It does. Yeah, without question. And, uh, and I think people uh, find it in expression or practice in different ways. But uh, um, I can't envision having gone through the things I've gone through without my faith. Well, listen, Tom, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. And, and uh, I hope everybody got at least a sense of, of who you are and what you've given personally to the Army and the sacrifices you talked about and being away from your family. I mean, it, it's you kind of you talk about it, but it is really even from another old soldier, if you will. You know, you, you have set a standard and a bar that very few people are going to ever obtain. And it, it's been a great talking to you. And it was just great pleasure serving with you. Humbled and honored. Yeah. yeah. Oh, anyway. Bless you. Well, look, I, I hope you guys. I hope you guys got something out of that. I know you did. Yeah. Uh, Tom is. It's been. He's been a friend of mine for a number of years. And we take from that is that he is a guy. He he is a a chaplain. So I think for a lot of people to get that in your mind, a priest, a rabbi, or whatever, is a guy. Obviously, an educated guy. A guy maybe he's sitting in the office. A guy maybe who comes. You know, you see on Sunday. Tom is out wherever the bullets are flying. That's where he goes. If you could have seen his, his hash marks on his arm, I don't know how many hash marks he has. And each time you get a mark, it's, it's six months straight of, <laughs> of combat. But listen, Tom, Tom as he sec, talked about in there, has been to over a couple hundred funerals. You know, he is a guy who puts himself in the middle of the action, whether it's the fighting or whether it's the consequences of the fighting. And he takes on all that responsibility, and he's been doing it. I was just thinking, it, he joined in 74. This is 2016, so you're looking at 42 years. How many, how now, many he would have gone to college in there, but you're looking at 40 years. The amount of people who've done that, they're probably .0001 or so, somewhere really? in there. I mean, Th- does the that, mil- that's Does a the military um, kind of move you out after, after that much time, or can you... Uh, if, if the military is an up or out kind of organization, obviously, but, I mean... Um, it used to be 30 years and you were pretty much done. The war has allowed people to stay or encouraged people to stay or we needed people to stay. Sure. But still, making it to 40 years, I mean, just the toll it takes on your body, right. the physical toll. And again, this is a guy who spent most of his career in special ops, so even though he's a chaplain, he's road marching with a rucksack on his back. He's jumping out of airplanes. He's in firefight. I mean, he's doing everything that anybody else is doing. I, I, I don't think it's a secret, though, why he's able to do it that long, because he talked about that it's important to find something bigger than yourself. And, mm-hmm. you know, he talked about with him, it was his faith. His faith really reshaped his life. And he told the story about when that happened. But he, he was great in that he didn't make it that it had to be faith. He said it can be family, it can be your unit, but you need to find something bigger why? than yourself to, to be part of. And, um, and so here's a guy who, I mean, he's got it all, right? He has uh, family, he has the military, he has his soldiers, he has God, he has his he has whole mission. respect of, yeah, that's really, kind of, to me, I mean, yeah. he's got the respect of everybody that he's ever come in touch Absolutely. or contact with. And, and I think a big part of that is the humility is what breeds respect yeah. because yeah. there's no um, better than anyone when he talks. He talks very openly about his challenges that he came from from the past and, right. and he talked about how you know he came through at a time when the military was struggling with that and he was the poster child, I think is yeah. the way he put it. We're, we're about the same age. and I, So he joined in 74 and went right out of high school. So I think he would have graduated in 75. So it would have been the same year I graduated high yeah. school. But I, I went to college a couple of years and quit then. Went sure, in. Yeah, yeah. But I joined in Marine Corps in 78. And in 78, we still lived in an open barracks. So there were 44 guys. We had 22 beds, bunk beds. Oh, 44 guys in a room in North Carolina with one wall air conditioner. That's a separate story about misery. Yeah. But there were maybe five of us back then that weren't taking some types of drugs. Yeah. 
And we weren't, we weren't looked at well because we weren't part of, the, you know, we couldn't be trusted. We, we were the outsiders, right? So I, I just, I, I remember those days when the military was in bad shape. Uh, th- those days are long, long, long gone. It's a total cultural not, not to go, shift. Not to go down that rabbit hole, but I mean, that was coming out of the 60s, so it wasn't unique. Well, to it was coming out of Vietnam out of the 70s is what it was. Right. I mean, that was right. late 70s, Vietnam War, 72-ish over, so you still had some res- residue there, and you still you had drug use. Yeah. One pill makes you stronger. One pill makes you. And, and he didn't want to go down that rabbit hole. Oh, <laughs> but, 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 but no, but 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 he talked about though about um, uh, how important it is not to isolate yourself. And when people get into the trouble, and when they when you know um, they they move away from everyone else. And he talked about how the, he had a mentor, the the fellow who who really right. helped him, and in a very um, non confrontational way, gave him um, a context in which to put his life. And I, 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 that really resonated with me. The idea about um, you know, uh, we did another interview recently with Nelson Diaz, who talked about that you have to have people to serve, and if it's just about you, it isn't. It doesn't work. And so, um, I, I just really was moved by everything he said about. Um, there's a guy who serves his country, who serves his God, who serves his family, and um, and it really was was very real. Yeah, and and like one of the earlier podcasts, so we talked about his family being on, his wife being on parallel lines that they'd had. What shared lives but not shared memories? Okay, sure, yeah, sure. yeah, you know, because yeah, yeah. because of the amount of time he'd been away. And I jokingly said in the podcast, and it's true, he would he would say, "Look, uh, you know, there's nothing going on in Tampa. I need to go to Afghanistan. Uh, I'll be back in a couple of weeks." And you wouldn't see him for six months. Yeah, you know, he would just stay because that's right. where that's where he was needed, kind of thing. But of course, you know, he's got a wife back home. It's yeah. there's one other thing that he mentioned that I just wanted to touch on that yeah. was I thought really important. He talked about, and if there's anyone who knows about stress and post-traumatic stress, it's this guy who's been in the situation and, like you say, held the hands of people who are dying. And, um, but he talked about how important it is that while we're treating the post-traumatic stress, which is a very real issue, we also need to look for the opportunity for post-traumatic order. And I thought, what an interesting way to put it. Instead of disorder, okay. which rather than that just being the only option, the idea is if you can help these people find a positive context in which to put their experience and that they're stronger for it, that they come back better able to contribute because of the experience and the lessons and the um, things that they've gone through, um, that they can actually create order out of the post-trauma. And I just thought that was such a powerful, powerful way to put that. Well, Colonel Knight, um, in, with Tactivate, right? Ma'am. Which Ma'am. You, <laughs> thank you, sir. Um, You've helped us out, and we, we've worked with a lot of special operations veterans. We think that they're the greatest assets, um, not untapped resource that the country has, but really a lot of their skills uh, aren't as well understood by the Voss populace or whatever you want to say it is. And they're some of the... No, I don't I know. know maybe not. I know what but, it is. <laughs> but there's some of, there's some of the, 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 the most well-trained people that totally facilitate the role of entrepreneurship when they're mission-driven and are taught that new sort of paradigm. That takes it into a whole different realm. But I think the idea of like taking the disorder, like that dis yes. off of attention deficit disorder, it's a gift, not a disorder. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Taking like, It's so negative, the labels that we put on, when really, like, let's change this folks well, let's, and let's look at like a, how we can celebrate those gifts right but not everybody everybody that goes to combat comes back affected yeah for sure for sure you, you are changed right, not everybody comes thought. back disaffected if you well, I get you know when saying not everybody it goes through the traumatic uh, the post traumatic stress right no of course I mean I again I think begin, it, uh, I, I, this uh, is a much longer episode it is. <laughs> well right. yeah, yeah but, but I, I, no, I think but I, and I, I totally hear what you're saying and, and, and no and, baseline for and that and in either case I think the, the, what we need to do and, and what is being done is to figure out how to help all those people integrate all those experiences into, into, the, into their new life. They're, they're like valuable them. assets, that's for sure. Hey, like speaking them. of valuable assets and experiences, I know we got to go. I want to have you go to YouTube. I want to have you go to iTunes. I want you to go to Spartan.com slash podcast. See some of our other great guests. And I know uh, you just referenced another interview. Sometimes we'll be back and forth interviews we've done before. We've got 150 some now, which Are we is done astonishing. Or Something like that. I think we filmed uh, over 200. Yeah. So, it, it's, so, so there is a paid, lot of... been paid for like 37, though. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of wisdom out there. We're going to go get, do... You get paid? We're, we're going to go do our bookkeeping and uh, see what's going on here. Thanks so much. Thank you for watching another epic story of success. <laughs> if you like our message, please share Spartan Up with your friends and subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you catch our show, maybe in the woods. Spartan Up is brought to you by Spartan Race. To find a race near you, visit Spartan.com. Spartan.com.